Welcome to week eight. It's time to talk image and text. So one of the things you might have noticed throughout the course content videos is that I've been putting in the XKCD comic strip. In part, there's usually an XKCD comic to cover any given circumstance or situation. And the author is quite happy for their work to be used under an open source license. And this is also a throwback to when I wrote my e-marketing textbook. I embedded a lot of his content and his materials into the text. So it's a bit of a tradition. But what it also is, is a really good example of the power of relatively simple imagery as an ongoing, continuing asset. So XKCD has been running for well over 10 years, given I used it in my 2011 text. It's just an example that you can have relatively basic, rel freehand drawings, simple stick figures with personality that become your core value proposition so long as you're producing something that the market finds to be interesting. So we're approaching the shift and now we're in image and text. We're heading towards the tail end of semester we're starting to get up to the point that you're going to need to start appraising your project for how well you're approaching your deadlines and how well you're hitting your marks and your metrics. And with that in mind, we're going to have a look at image and the power of the graphic as an element within your value offer. For those of you who have been using Instagram and similar services across the semester, this is basically reinforcement of some of your trade skills you've already practiced. For those of you who have been on perhaps video platforms, you would have been dealing with the need to create image thumbnails and you would have been dealing with the value of inserting an image now and then. One of the things just that before we commence is that there are a lot of different file formats this is a brief overview of the common types. Usually JPEG is our go-to, uh, followed by GIF. Bitmap has more specialist applications. Uh, it shows up a lot in video games, particularly around textures, around sprites and sprite mapping. The PNG file, I don't know if it's called PengBy, I always call it PNG. This is a format that I use when I need to keep something in a relatively low resolution or with transparency. Uh, the little boundary box that you see on screen is in fact a transparent PNG file. So it works well with OBS. PSD files are Photoshop files that this is the master copy. So any of the edited images that you see at the front end of our PowerPoints and our videos, these are from photos that I took, which I've been editing in Photoshop, and I now have a PSD file that is approximately 40 layers of high resolution photos deep and around, mm, around far too many, far too much in the way of file size. Uh, suffice to say, it's a good thing I have a powerful computer. I don't recommend going that far. And the last one on the list, that list there is Apple's attempt to replace the GIF and the JPEG with their own proprietary file format, and it didn't work. It was a dumb idea, Apple. Give it up. Uh, you think, okay, you got the MP4 to dominate over the MP3, but the hoof file is not going to be the JPEG anytime soon. The other thing about the GIF file is that it does allow for animations. PNG files allow for transparency, and JPEG files are good for high definition and photos. I'd also like to now introduce you to the hex codes. FF, FF, FF is the hex code for the light gray background of all of our text boxes. The key with the hex code is that it has value beyond just using it in HTML and just using it for markup language. 
you can translate between different platforms and get a universal color. So when I'm using Photoshop and I'm setting up my color scheme in Photoshop, if I take a note of the hex codes, I can come over to PowerPoint, put that hex code into the custom color and get the same color range. So the hex codes describe ranges of color and they are relatively universal. I mean, it's not perfectly universal, but it's good enough. So it's worth knowing what they are and knowing how to work with them. You don't have to memorize them. There's not going to be a point in time where you can't simply look at a code. Uh, if there's a point that you can input a color, there's a point where you can extract its hex code. Now, the other thing we need to talk about is the image metadata. In audio, I got particularly uh, aggressive around the damage that's been done to the Audacity file because, and the Audacity software because of my concerns about it layering on additional metadata. Now, when you take a photo, and particularly if you take a photo off a smart device, it embeds a huge amount of data into the photo file. And this is known as metadata. It includes things like GPS coordinates, whether the flash was on or off. The, sometimes it will include the device name, and by the device name it will include the photographer's name and details. The key is control. You may find metadata to be very useful and something worth retaining. Or you may find metadata to be something that needs to be scrubbed from an image for your personal privacy, personal safety, or the safety of others, particularly if you've been involved in filming protests or you have created content that you don't want to immediately trace back to you. So be mindful of metadata and be conversant as to what you want to retain what you want to overwrite and what you want to get rid of. So these items are up here as a reminder that data exists and data can be found in places you weren't expecting. Also, your Word documents contain metadata, your PDF files contain metadata, so do the PowerPoints. Metadata is inherently a neutral tool and it can be a very valuable value co-creating, value add-on function, but also it can be a right pain if it's giving away information that you weren't prepared to share or you weren't ready to share. So as always, be clever, be smart and be aware. Now let's talk image software. Uh, as much as I love the Picasa photo file management system and I've endorsed it for many, many years, it has been long out of date and it is struggling on its last software equivalent of legs as Windows 10 gradually updates further and further away from its functionality. But basically, Picasa is here because it is a photo management toolkit. I have a ridiculously large number of images. Uh, I, have, I take a lot of photos and I create a lot of images. I create I generate content, that's one of those things. So the fact that I have an image, all the images that we see, all the photos that you see inside this course have come from my own photo library. I do this for two reasons. As a content creator, this gives me copyright control over the works that I produce and the derivative works that I can then on license through Creative Commons or I can share through knowing that I control the master copy and it doesn't put the university or my school at risk. Equally, I also really, I've been using Photoshop since 1993. Uh, I was using it before they introduced layers into the software. So I really like photo editing in Photoshop. But uh, because I create a lot of content, I also need a good management tool. And Google's Picasa tool was that, still is that to some extent when it's not crashing and 
running into challenges and failure mode. But effectively, there are now alternatives out there. I just haven't been willing to transfer across. And just a quick reminder, I know that I, when I talk about relative advantage in innovation adoption, the new alternatives to Picasa are yet to have a relative advantage over an old, broken, and beaten down software package because it still does the primary job sorting files, importing files, and managing them in a user-friendly manner, and it does it better than the current alternatives. The moment something does it better than Picasa, I'm there, but no matter, now technically I'm currently a laggard in this class because I've adopted something and I've been unwilling to disadopt. I'm what they've referred to in the Lego category as a super adopter in that I am waiting for the technology to reach my desired value proposition threshold. Nothing's there yet, so I'm using an ancient Antica software. Now the other software I want to mention, uh, for those of you who are running Instagram and want to back up your Instagram account, 4K Storygram, uh, the 4K, the whole group and 4K are very good in terms of the other archival software they've got available. They have a YouTube archiver and those are the two I mainly use but they also have an audio capturing uh, archiving system. So this is very useful for being able to snapshot your account, bring it down for offline analysis. Uh, as a researcher who has done a lot of work in the Instagram field uh, myself and Tony Eager have written papers on Instagram. We have used a range of archival software packages in our research, and Storygram's pretty good. I do have, disclaimer, I do own the paid version of it, and I found it to be very useful. Similar disclaimer, I own a license through the ANU for Photoshop. So yes, literally, I took a Photoshop I took a screen cap of Photoshop and put it through Photoshop because I heard I liked Photoshop, so I put a Photoshop on my Photoshop. There are open source alternatives, Glimpse. I haven't used it because, as I said, I've got over approaching 30 years of experience with this software package, and I really like it. Uh, I get it's in more frequent use on my computer than my copy of Microsoft Word. So I can go several days without writing a document, but I'm unlikely to go more than a day without having some image editing event or doing something with Photoshop. So it, PowerPoint, and VLC are probably my top uh, items here. Again, a lot of the images you'll see, all the screen captures, all the screenshots, were put through Photoshop before being put into PowerPoint. And yes, this is the uh, meta recursion of a Photoshop image in Photoshop, in PowerPoint, screen captured in Photoshop. Because what is meta if not to be ridiculous? So your question, your question here is around the value proposition. What is the value of an an image. And there are the four categories that we have agreed upon at the start of the semester, the producer, prosumer, consumer, and conducer. Images work differently for each of those categories. For a producer, an image's purpose is to convey something to an audience. On the other side, for a conducer, the image's purpose is to convey something to you. So the photo you take as a memory enhancement tool, the photo you take just for yourself and for your own private use, that's a conduction behavior, that's a conducer outcome, and that is creating value for yourself using the same technique you would use to create value for others. Inside your projects, for those of you who are running shops and selling commercial products, photos are the first port of call for the consumer to be able to assess what it is 
that constitutes the value offer. For those of us using audio, we have a potent use of the image to convey a message towards the music or the audio file. Those of us using video, uh, you'll see that each of these videos has a thumbnail and each of these videos has an image that's tied to the week's image. There is an ongoing recurrent thematic clustering. You also see that they're all marked with the uh, the course logo and the course brand. So there's a lot of elements of promotion, of branding, of uh, communication and intentional acts of communicating through image. And finally, for all of you who have been looking at the photos and all of you who have an Instagram account and scroll through having a bit of a read and a bit of a look, that's what image consumption is about. Seeing photos, seeing images, consuming them. Taking photos then, the presumption, the closest thing or the strangest thing in presumption is actually the fact, the value of the GIF and the meme and the ability to hold conversation through the use of images and existing things like GIFs. So the animated GIF conversation on Waterfall, the meme, meme posts, they are all about presumption. You are using what already exists to make something else, a conversation or a communication. So let's talk price. Uh, this is the notion of free, price as free. Uh, and this is, in my case, uh, the image collection, myself and a friend sharing our images in our uh, Facebook chat. Both of us are fans of Max Headroom, the TV series. So it was a great opportunity to uh, screen cap us talking shop and also the fact that we're old media guys, that uh, this is my videographer who was responsible for taking videos back before we had video capture in lecture theatres. I would bring my video guy in with, you know, he had the big over the shoulder camera mount happening, or we'd have a camera on the tripod and he would record the lectures for me, which we would then edit down and put up either into the library on a VHS tape or put into the library, put up using real player, real media, somewhere on a website. But when it's shared between friends, it's free. Now, the idea of the freemium is when we look at somewhere like an image hosting site, like Imager, uh, where the images are supported, the distribution and sharing of images is supported by the presence of advertising. This then follows on to aspects such as photo bucket. Now, quick note, photo bucket used to be free and used to be freemium supported. Then it switched up to being a premium model. But when it switched over, it broke a lot of its existing content and a lot of its existing links. Because instead of those links having a legacy aspect and maintaining photo buckets of value around the internet at the various points these images were embedded in forums, they basically thought they could hold people to ransom for well, all the stuff you've shared previously will go away. And people's response was, well, okay, bye. Uh, it just shows a broken link saying this was hosted on Photobucket. just says that your brand sucks. Uh, so Photobucket actually managed to take a strong market position and drive a tractor over it. Came out the other side with a okay-ish value proposition, but definitely was a... It was not the resounding success they thought it would be. Other places where it's subscription to access capacity and or access content. Shutterstock has a subscription in terms of gaining content from it. So you can license content for use in other platforms. Now, as I've mentioned in the video and in the audio, I have an ongoing subscription with Envato, uh, which I use to license audio and video, and I use stock video from there. I've been less successful in finding stock out of interest. 
Uh, I don't have projects for which I've needed stock art yet. But you can also see the subscription in platforms such as Flickr. The other way you can incorporate price, yeah, it's back. The non-fungible token is back. Um, yeah, buying the exclusive license to digital images. It's a thing. It happens. It's out there. It's a pricing thing. Uh, that basically means that price now is embedded in the NFT is a value offer of a form. It is a product of a form. Uh, it's here because I've got to acknowledge that it's taking place and it's happening, but I'm less convinced it's a marketer's toolkit. That said, it's absolutely, oh God, the market segmentation on this is amazing. This is about knowing your target market. Redditors are way more likely to be into crypto, cryptocurrency. They're way more likely to care about blockchain. If you are a Redditor and this is resonating with you, what that means is that Reddit's a really good product fit for you. And that's awesome. It also means that the crypto uh, OpenSea knows their market and knows that Redditors are way more likely to pay money for a Redditor related piece of NFT content. And I say way more likely versus actually because at time of screen capture, not a lot of transaction was taking place here. But still, it's all about knowing your market and knowing your audience. So moving out of the financial price and moving into non-financial price, there's a range of ways because it's really open-ended and we cover such a gamut of things from pre-existing memes and GIFs and the effort required to capture just the right scene from your favorite movie versus searching to see if somebody else has done it for you. Capping that, you know, almost real-time capping of GIFs that takes place on major events like the Super Bowl or inauguration speeches in the US. Uh, that's energy and effort. That's a lot of people the fact that there were near real-time GIFs available from the recent Academy Awards and they were almost ahead of real-time was quite a remarkable thing. So it was like someone had access to the feed and was just slicing it into a, a GIF editor before the feed was making it out to the general public. In terms of learning curves around images, photography has a... Photography is interesting because it's got a very plateaued curve. You can get acceptably okay with uh, a mobile phone and then you can scale up to really really difficult with digital SLRs and high-tech similarly for things like 3d rendering or graphics creation or art and drawing XKCD is a relatively basic drawing style but there are artists out there who are producing va items of value to their audiences that are good fit with the artist's skill set and good fit with the audience demand and they range from very basic images through to very complex images. So again it's really variable uh, particularly around consumption. The, an image should be very easy in one sense but an image can also be multifaceted and layered and difficult to unpack because art theory exists and it exists in practice. So, distribution, uh, the digital and tangible. Look, frankly, at the moment, every single part of this course has had some image in there. It is absolutely throughout the Waffle site. Uh, the little headers for each of the weeks, even the background for this image. There is just digital and tangible everywhere. The digital tangible is where the file exists. Now this is an interesting element because when we take photos, we create digital tangibles. We upload those photos into Facebook, we create digital intangibles. We then download that photo to go and put a layer of text over it and we create a digital tangible from a digital intangible from a digital tangible and we make it into a meme. But also when you save things to your hard drive, when you 
have built up uh, on your phone you've got a special folder for those memes you've been saving for when you're scrolling through your favorite social media and they say stop this is a meme checkpoint functionally memes are usually saved to the hard drive particularly reaction gifs and reaction memes so that you don't have to go looking for it you know where it is and you've got it stored which turns the digital intangible to the digital tangible for the express purpose of uploading it to make it digital intangible. I guess. Now, we can create the convertible intangible. Uh, I do own a Polaroid camera because I like that. Uh, I bought it for an art project and the Lego Series Play project work that I do photo on the side there is the time that I accidentally created a Lego shrine during a Lego exhibit held at the ANU pop-up gallery a couple of years ago now. The idea here is that you can, again, take your image that's a bunch of pixels and a bunch of data and turn it into a physical printout relatively easily. And you can do it at the commercial grade level as well. So from sending something down to Officeworks to be printed out to using a service like Snapfish or Photobook to create photo albums. There is a boundary point where it stops being about the photo and starts being about a different product entirely, but I'm not interested in chasing that definition and carving that line out right now. Functionally, you can distribute an image over atoms and it has its value. Now, mediated intangible, I've referenced vector stock here whilst I use Envato. Uh, vector stock, some of these stock art places are also useful if you are into art, uh, you have an artistic side or you take a lot of photos, good quality photos. You can on sell your work into the stock art galleries. So if you are finding, uh, you're enjoying the creation of content and visual content and image content, Consider this as a wholesale retail outlet for your work. But what you also do, when you buy from a platform like Vectorstock, you get a license to reuse. And some of those licenses, it's always worth reading the instructions. But you then can use that work inside your own creative work and not run afoul of copyright laws. Um, we continue down looking, I continue looking baffled at the non-fungible tokens. Uh, the idea of the proof of purchase, uh, yeah, look, the problem is one of the things about non, the NFTs, apart from the horrific environmental impact that they're having in terms of their destructive use of energy, is that you're not actually buying the artifact. It's not like you're going to pay me five Ethereum or six Bitcoin for this badge, which I then send to you and I no longer possess the badge because it's transferred ownership. Instead, what would happen is that you would buy the image rights for this screenshot snap, which you would then have to trust that A, as you took exclusive possession, I had no other screenshots and I didn't keep the master file, and B, functionally you are buying the receipt and the proof of purchase of the transaction, you aren't buying the original master copy. NFTs are a flawed product, but if there are value propositions that's working for you, you are its market, I am not its market. Now let's look at a couple of case studies. Uh, obviously the big one that we've all been encountering over the course of the semester is Instagram. It is one of the better image distribution, presumption, consumption platforms that's out there. They've made it slightly harder to work with recently. Uh, there are a few problems starting to emerge and also 
inevitably Facebook's gonna do something stupid like try and roll Instagram completely into Facebook and you'll have all the problems of Facebook and none of the benefits of Instagram but at the moment it's there uh, a couple of key things it has in terms of it has curation functions it has text-based elements including the captions and the cross engagement that you can do through comments and community and it has discoverability through hashtags now I mentioned Shutterstock previously I'm gonna mention Shutterstock again it's also the home of um, serious weirdness uh, the whole women laughing at salad photo genre yes it's what it says on the tin it's photos of women laughing at salad Not only does it provide value to a certain audience, it provides sufficient value for it to be a competitive market of multiple providers. We're talking about something that's in the maturity phase of the product lifecycle because enough people have bought enough content to warrant it continuing as a trend. Shutterstock basically is a brokerage. It's a value and exchange factory. It's a value and use factory. Uh, it does content licensing, so if you do get to the point that you are wanting to sell your materials, you can go through Shutterstock or Envato or another platform. Now Canva, a bit of a flashback to one of our tools that we have made use of over time. Canva's an online editing system, so basically Canva is a value and use proposition that is taking pre-existing content, licensed content, and your own content and being able to repurpose it and reuse it. So it has a very strong prosumer producer side to it, but it also has a conducer aspect where you can use it to create stuff for yourself. Uh, you could use Canva to provide all of the images for your ePortfolio. You could use it to create reflective visual artifacts for the portfolio. Now I've mentioned Flickr in the past. Uh, Flickr is an interesting element of it's also another platform that was very successful independently. Uh, it was a subscription based you paid money for hosting image hosting platform. Yahoo bought it and in true Yahoo form managed to add a whole series of barriers to it being useful to use and Whilst I still maintain my Flickr subscription, I don't get as much value from putting content into it as I used to. I would like to get back into it. It's one of those areas where I think that uh, the co-creation aspect, the value and use aspect, is really more powerful than its inherent merit. But it is one of those things where uh, it and Tumblr are a case study in Yahoo spending a lot of money to buy something that was working, then promptly break it, then sell it again for a massive loss, were all the while looking confused about the fact that they came in, they bought a classic car, they drove it straight into a power pole, and then looked confused as to why the value went down. All right, final thing to talk about, the theory and application for this week. We're talking about, we're gonna bring Instagram back into effect, and Instafamous Social Media Influencer. This is about the applied use of images of the self. Now I could have run with the Igar and Dan selfies paper, but I didn't because I like this paper here and I think it works quite nicely. What's the key takeaway here? Source credibility and relatability or as Rogers95 Innovation Adoption would say, compatibility and relative advantage. Functionally, Instagrammers create strong social connection and social influence where parasocial connection gives them a, an air of credibility. If you look the part, if you look like you are authentic to your content, that makes it easier for it, for people to use their schemas, use their 
draw a little bit on advertising theory, theory here, there's no schema mismatch. If you look like the kind of person endorsing the lifestyle that you're leading and promoting the product and promoting the content and promoting the services that fits the sort of lifestyle people could assume about you at a glance, then you're going to have strong credibility. And you can do this through still frame images. That's the power of an image. So we're not talking about video-based influence here. We're talking about static photos. Parasocial connection through selfies. And it's freaking awesome that we can achieve that. And for those of you who are looking for Insta fame and Insta famous, good luck. And look, throw us a, a hashtag and a shout out when you get to the top. So, also in the background, one of the modified uh, images that we I use taken during a heavy fog period uh, in winter on the campus. Uh, pre-COVID, so there's a 2019 photo, I think. As always, you want to reach out over the socials, on the email, or through the Waddle site. And with that, see you in the sequel.